Glad to meet you all here. We are broadcasting from uh, Nikolaus Copernicus University from the University Library uh, with the next chapter of uh, UFA Academy Lectures. And uh, today you will have the opportunity to uh, uh, listen to Professor Wojcisław Duch from the Faculty of uh, Physics, Astronomy and Informatics with a lecture uh, concerning um, um, artificial intelligence, uh, Mm, narrow technology and human augmentation and you are probably all aware of uh, all the substantial growth uh, in this research area in the past years in in, in brain measuring and uh, we are happy to uh, uh, take all of your questions we will answer them at the end of the lecture so if you had like any comments uh, or questions please uh, uh, paste them into the tab uh, and uh, I will pass uh, to Professor Wojcisław Duch. The floor is yours. Glad to meet you. Ed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you about the brave new world that is coming because of artificial intelligence and neurotechnologies and how that will change humanity forever. So uh, we're in Torun, and Torun, as you know, is the most important city in the world if uh, you look at the origin of science. And this is because Nicolas Copernicus was born here 550 years ago. And this was the major change in the uh, development of science in the world. And so um, now we are going to look at what happens uh, with the development of technology. Uh, some people are wearing that we are close to what they call singularity. And this is because when you look at the um, speed of changes in technology, you find that uh, the major discoveries or the major changes are uh, coming faster and faster. So uh, recently we just had internet, we had computers uh, which are handheld or uh, smartphones, uh, we have uh, nanotechnologies coming, we have biotechnologies of all sorts, but uh, most of all the artificial intelligence which becomes autonomous and in some areas it has already reached the superhuman level and uh, especially when you think about our brains, uh, there is a chance that the brain computer interfaces are going to link us to artificial intelligence and the neurotechnologies are going to change and restructure our brains. So the question is, are we on the threshold of, uh, of a pleasant dream or kind of utopia or is it a nightmare coming? Uh, that's the main question. Is transhuman, transhuman society around the corner? So uh, when you think about this civilization, uh, you can think about several different uh, steps uh, in the development. One is, and, and each of them can be found in, in today's uh, societies. Uh, that is, there are people who believe in magical thinking. The whims of God, fatalism, and all kinds of magic uh, that they think is still present. Uh, there, there were people um, about two and a half thousand years ago developing proto-science, empirical observations, thinking about descriptive knowledge, causality. Uh, they uh, talked uh, later in the 16th, 17th century about classical science, that is empirical verification of the theories that they have been developing, uh, mathematical uh, approaches and statistics have developed, but only in the second part of the 20th century we had enough computer power to, to simulate complex systems and new kind of science, as, as Stephen Wolfram has called it, has emerged. Then um, about 20 years ago people started to talk about the big data and how to extract knowledge from enormous amount of data uh, and knowledge that we are not aware of because it's just too complex to extract that. And uh, then AI has developed to the level where it could support thinking and uh, now we are talking about autonomous AI that is artificial intelligence that can work on its own. Um, and the final step, and this is what is coming in this decade, is the superhuman augmentation that is coupling AI to our brains and restructuring our brains. So IBM, for example, talks about four uh, different paradigms in development of science, the empirical science, theoretical science, computational science, big data driven science, and then the age of accelerated discovery as they call it, because now we have uh, super complex systems which have billions of parameters and which can help us, can be our partner in developing science and understanding the world. 
And so also people in business started to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And in the fourth industrial revolution, they talk about artificial intelligence and robotics, of course, but also about behavioral science, about human enhancement, uh, about neuroscience, and uh, personalized medicine, and lots of other things. All of them depend on our understanding how brains work and uh, artificial intelligence that helps us to develop things. So there, there are four big branches, let's say, or foundations for all this development. One is that physicists have developed nanotechnologies because they have a quantum uh, mechanics. And uh, quantum technologies allow us to make now structures, which you have in your phones and your watches, which are like uh, well, billions of millimeters uh, uh, size, right? This is the nanotechnology. And then we have the bioscience, which is creating things like biohybrids, like uh, uh, organelles and um, and also allowing us to understand what happens in the brain to some degree. Uh, neurocognitive informatics is just trying to learn from that. Then we have cognitive science or behavioral sciences which, which teach us how to interact in a human-like natural way with the artificial systems. And of course, the foundation of all this is that we have computational power, we have the artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, neural networks. So, so what is intelligence? Well, not a long time ago, people were writing, especially philosophers, were writing critical books on, well, intelligence is something that uh, machines are not able to reach. And they had all kinds of examples, like, uh, for, for example, here, only people have, may have a common sense, only people can review something, only people can um, write, uh, 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 can uh, drive a car, uh, or can understand speech and other things like that. Most of these things, as you know, is now done by artificial intelligence with quite uh, some accuracy, sometimes better than humans. And so this critique was really true about what we call the GoFi, the good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, which was trying to teach computers what we already know. But we know certain things. Uh, if we can describe that, and then we can have an algorithm that says step by step how to find a solution. This is what people in computer science have been doing. But uh, initially, we also had some ideas how to solve approximately uh, situations in which we would uh, like to find some solutions which will not be perfect because it's impossible, because there are all kinds of levels of complexity that people in computer science have discovered, and some problems are simply so complex that no amount of computations can solve them. And these are the problems where no effective algorithms exist that artificial intelligence tries to solve. So in 21st century, what happens is that uh, artificial intelligence uh, was not anymore uh, something that people try to teach machines, but they rather wanted to create systems that are going to learn themselves, like we do, uh, and there are many things that we learn and we just don't know how. We cannot explain to the machine what it means to understand uh, human speech, for example, because we uh, have learned that spontaneously and we, we cannot explain that in words, uh, and especially in, in, in algorithms like that. But we can find some approximations based on the knowledge that's, that's in the data. So most important techniques uh, which have been developed are related to machine learning, especially neural networks. And what happens is that people started to develop neurocognitive technologies. And this is a combination of neuro, something that happens with neurons with our brain, and then cogito, which is the cognition, how we uh, recognize things. And uh, maybe you've heard that some governments try to regulate artificial intelligence, which is a bit funny because it's like saying, OK, we're going to regulate mathematics. What will that mean? I mean, uh, you can regulate products, you can regulate autonomous cars that use artificial intelligence, but definitely not regulate algorithms uh, which, which are like, like mathematics. So all real-world uh, applications, uh, uh, software and hardware, have to be regulated. When we look at the history, we see that initially there was this first wave of AI where people try to teach systems what we already know, these good old-fashioned uh, artificial intelligence systems, rule-based, expert systems based on, on uh, verbalized knowledge. The second wave, which started about 20 years ago, was that we had 
accumulated a lot of data. We could analyze that from statistical point of view. And because of that, people started to do, for example, machine translations. Because we have seen uh, our sentences in one language and other language, and we can kind of compare that, that this is probably about the same thing, and then do this translation. But after that, uh, since about maybe 214, people have also invented artificial imagination. And this is they have created uh, networks that fight with each other. They're called GUN, or Generative Adversarial Networks that actually uh, try to uh, compete with each other. One tries to deceive the network that already knows something, and the other is criticizing it. So, so this uh, deceiver is trying to improve its, uh, well, deceiving uh, technique somehow. So now we're talking about the third wave of artificial intelligence, in which we're going to not only um, solve the perception problem, uh, how to analyze computer vision and signals and uh, speech, etc., but also learn from uh, the data, also um, abstract information from the data, also reason based on these abstractions, and create models, um, contextual models of phenomena. So uh, we're talking about perceiving, learning, abstracting, reasoning, and then imagination and control. All of these things are uh, well, enabled by a very simple trick. The simple trick is that, well, if you look at the visual system, when I see something, this information from my retina comes to the back of my head, uh, to the primary visual cortex. But before I recognize this as a, maybe a watch or maybe this, this pilot that I have, uh, it goes through a lot of different uh, layers or uh, areas in the brain processing information. Uh, actually, in 91, we already had about 32 visual cortical areas which process information. So I'm aware of what happens at very highly processed level. And in between, uh, my brain is aware of things like, oh, I have uh, you know, some um, uh, maybe parallel lines or maybe slanted lines or other things like that. So if the system sees uh, a, a certain uh, character like A, it will just try to find simple elements in this character, left line, right line, and then parallel line. And then the next layer, uh, which will be the next layer in my visual system, will just try to see, OK, how many of these primitive characters are in the more complex objects that are encoded there. And once we find that, well, uh, we can find, actually, we can identify what it is. So this was called the pandemonium model, actually, and it was invented in 59. So what happened since that time is that we have learned how to set the parameters to do all these tricks. And if you look at the contemporary systems for computer vision, you find, OK, they're going to make small patches of the whole image. And the small patches start from analysis of, well, edges of uh, uh, maybe textures. So you see all the slanted edges and parallel and uh, vertical edges. Uh, and then uh, at the higher level, at the second level of processing, you see that the edges are combined into more complex structures, maybe eyes, nose, mouth, etc. And at the even higher level, all this is combined into a face-like representation. So this is, uh, this is what, what, what happens. Uh, here comes the image. And uh, this is just a sampling of, uh, of all these patches. And then step by step, we can identify, finally, what the image is about. And uh, well, that's one part of the story. This is the uh, pattern recognition. The other part of the story, which people usually think, OK, the left part of the brain is more logical, uh, oriented towards speech. The right part is more uh, pattern recognition, artistic, etc. Not quite so simple, but roughly in AI, actually, we've been focusing for a long time on good old-fashioned AI, which was logical and symbolic. Now we have solved also the problem of pattern recognition, which is kind of intuitive and spontaneous. And now we try to combine the two together. And it, it became so easy because people have created a huge uh, systems where you can just uh, say, OK, 
I'm going to look at the classification, maybe diagnostics. I have some medical data and I want to see whether I can diagnose that as a particular disease or mental disorder or whatever. And so I need to pick up some mo model, some method that can do the classification. Or maybe I don't know anything, I have lots of patients and I want to cluster them into similar groups. So I do the clustering or unsupervised learning as it's called. Or maybe I have to, well, predict how this uh, uh, procedure that we do with the patients uh, is going to influence the uh, uh, expected uh, life uh, uh, after, after the uh, surgery, let's say. So this is the regression. Uh, we just pick up the problem and what we want to do and find a software because the software is ready. You just have to understand a bit the parameters, but everybody can now use artificial intelligence because of the systems. Well, the downside of it is that uh, about 10 years ago, to train a big system, we needed about 1 million billion operations in a computer. 1 million billion, pretty large number. But after 10 years, and this is today, we need 1 billion times more than 1 billion million which is one billion, billion, million operations to train new big systems which have trillions of parameters. It's, it's just absolutely mind-blowing and incredible, and we simply did not expect it that something like that will happen. So we need supercomputer power, but also people started to work on something that is called neuromorphic hardware, that is um, uh, something that uh, has similar organizational structure as uh, our cortex or neurons, that is lots of connections, it's not very fast like the supercomputers, but because of lots of connections, the number of operations it can do is quite large. So if you look at this wall here, this is the old technology five years ago, we could do one sixth of chimps brain uh, when we look at the connections and the number of neurons. Now we can really reach the level of something like human brain. Lots of companies are now producing all this neuromorphic hardware. Moreover, you have a good chance that uh, some of it is in your smartphone, actually, for vision, uh, for uh, image recognition and image labeling, etc. So the newer systems will, will just like a, a chip from Cerebras, for example, will make one billion billion operations per second in one chip. Very nice. All this has created a situation in which some of, the, uh, of these uh, AI systems have reached superhuman level in many domains. One is reasoning. As you remember, in 97, Deep Blue has won in chess with Kasparov. This is Gary Kasparov playing with, uh, with the computer. And uh, then people said, OK, maybe chess is not so complicated, although it was for thousands of years. Maybe now we have a Go. And Go is so com much more complicated that it will take 100 years to win in Go. But unfortunately, in 2016, AlphaGo has won with the uh, Korean chess master, in 2017 with the Chinese world master. And then uh, just next uh, year, they have produced AlphaGo Zero. And AlphaGo Zero has won with AlphaGo 100 to 0 and have reached absolutely superhuman level. So reasoning is not for humans, it's for machines. OK. But then people said, OK, well, there are open games. Poker, for example, you never know what will be the cards. Uh, maybe also these uh, um, computer games like Dota or StarCraft, where there are so many different things you can do, so many different characters and uh, objects. It's just open game. Well, that was beaten by machines in 2017 and uh, 19. And this year, actually, we had also programs that can beat people in uh, games like Diplomacy or uh, Stratego. So what is left? Um, it doesn't seem that humans are better in any kind of well-defined or even loosely defined game. OK. Then we had a problem with perception. We could not understand the speech and the idea that we could talk to the phone and the phone will understand and, and, and answer was, well, something we could not imagine when I was a student. Definitely not. Now, of course, everybody is talking to the phone, right? Uh, the phone can actually also, uh, uh, if you show it some Chinese uh, writings, it can just translate it for you very easily. So the computer vision has been solved. You can recognize people just, just looking at them with your phone. Uh, you can recognize images, but also you can recognize things like personality trait, political, and uh, lots of other uh, uh, characteristics, uh, as you will see in a moment. 
In robotics, we've seen the robots that can actually do the backflip and autonomous vehicles are on the roads and um, in the US, lots of trucks are now autonomous, etc. Autonomous uh, automation of science is progressing and uh, I'll just say, uh, say a few words about that, but, but the recent development of AlphaFold 2 has shown how far we can go because uh, the OpenAI has just uh, has just published 600 million protein structures, which is absolutely mind-blowing and which will change the um, uh, whole pharmaceutical industry and our understanding of uh, molecular medicine, etc. Now, creativity and imagination, that seems to be very human, right? Uh, uh, well, uh, when Turing wrote his famous paper, 1950, uh, that, that was one of the objections, that machines will never be creative. Well, they have much better imagery than any human can have. And you have Depart, Midjourney, Iowa, and other things like that, and I'll, I'll just show you that in a moment. Then uh, the, the most complex function is language, because evolutionary, it's quite late in development, but it's really very complex. Uh, IBM in 2011 has created this, uh, this program called Watson, and it has one with humans answering questions, no restriction on what kind of questions. In 2018, Watson Debater was uh, debated, uh, de debating with professional philosophers and has won. Uh, in 2020, uh, the uh, system called BERT has uh, provided answers to the Stanford um, uh, 100,000 uh, questions uh, with uh, a level of accuracy higher than humans. And finally, we reach the, uh, the times when the brain-computer interfaces and optimization of our brains are coming, and this is what I will talk at the end. So uh, if you look at what AlphaGo has done, it has shown that thousands of years of human experience does not count, because the system doesn't have any kind of, of uh, knowledge, like the chess system before, that we have been taught on what uh, all that people knew about chess, all kinds of you know, uh, um, uh, starting uh, situations, positions, and other things. AlphaGo starts from zero, learns just playing by itself, and it reaches the level which is very far from human abilities now. Okay, the protein folding, as I mentioned, uh, in, 2000, uh, uh, in 2018, suddenly people were able to well, solve about 40% of all uh, uh, proteins with the accuracy comparable with experiment. But then AlphaFold showed that you can go up to maybe almost 60, and then AlphaFold uh, uh, Alpha 2 <laughs> to about 90. And uh, now we have predictions uh, of 600 million proteins. We, we, in our body, we have maybe 10,000 only, uh, uh, maybe a few tens of thousands, but, uh, but w with bacteria and, and all, all kinds of microbes, we have 600 million proteins. And uh, the system can solve the structures uh, with the accuracy that, that is comparable with um, experiments. Uh, people doing material science have also started to use AI and found that they can actually find in the literature, which is enormous, uh, how to uh, create new kind of materials. For example, this was the, one of the first, 2019, one, one of the first papers showing that this uh, latent knowledge of how to construct batteries can be read from lots of our articles, but nobody is able to read so many articles. So, so all this is, is, is uh, really the, uh, um, the topic of nature science um, Articles and now we have this uh, transformer type of uh, large systems GPT-3, which has hundreds of applications in business, education, uh, philosophy, research, creative writing, and many other fields. So this is uh, this is one example of what we have learned uh, in control. And you can control airplanes, you can control all kinds of things, and even heavy robot like that, which can do the backflip. Not many people can do this, right? Uh, well, you can think, okay, but there are some areas like law. In law, certainly human is the most important. Unfortunately, there is lots of things in law that you can actually automatize. And there are companies like What's Sun Exterior that had 100 lawyers and now has just five and is doing quite well. Uh, it's using the system called eDiscovery. E uh, JP Morgan has been uh, uh, analyzing uh, loan agreements with high speeds, with uh, few errors, etc. 
lots of uh, applications in law. And surprisingly, Deep Knowledge Venture has appointed an AI robot to the board of directors. Not yet maybe directing the whole thing, but advising directors and trying to predict what will be the effect of uh, their uh, changes or uh, their decisions, right? Uh, because someone has looked at the, um, at the uh, well, uh, effects of regulation. So there will be lots of vanishing profes professions, but th th that's not a new phenomenon because in the last 100 years or maybe 200 years, lots of professions have vanished. I mean, I, I've watched like the ladies who were typing the uh, computer programs for us, well, have vanished because now we type it ourselves, right? <laughs> we have quite different computers. Uh, among dying profes pr professions, I mean, the predictions are that 85 million jobs will be lost. Um, uh, among these dying profession, uh, professor, uh, professions <laughs> are telemarketers. In Poland, we have 200,000 people who are telemarketers, right? The bots now are very stupid, but soon they are going to be much smarter than people. Okay, as, as, I'll, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, uh, travel agents, postal of, uh, uh, officials, sellers, cashiers, uh, mechanics also, because you can regulate electronics in cars uh, remotely, uh, largely. Uh, mortgage brokers, uh, uh, taxi drivers, truck drivers, farmers also. I mean, very few will be left. Uh, lawyers, uh, journalists, reporters, booksellers, that is already ongoing. And also the creative jobs like architects, uh, photographers, artists, etc. So superhuman perception uh, means that, that uh, uh, artificial systems may derive information from uh, visual or uh, auditory or other kind of stimulations that we are not really very good at. Uh, for example, emotions, character traits, crimi criminal tendencies, etc. There was a Chinese paper showing 5,000 uh, photographs with prisoners and uh, the other 5,000 with people who are not criminals. And uh, they claim that the um, uh, neural networks that they have used gave them 97% of accuracy how to distinguish criminals from non-criminals. This is very debatable because uh, they had to, <laughs> they did not have the, uh, the ethics committee permission to do that. They have withdrawn the paper, but the paper is well known. And uh, we're not quite clear how that happened. But using just five photos of a person, you can recognize the uh, sexual preferences of people. And uh, humans can do that in case of men at the level of 61%, machines with 91%. So you can imagine that you're going to have an augmented reality glasses and you're going to know a lot of things about people that you don't know now or with much higher accuracy. So this actually, uh, Michał Kosiński, who is uh, at Stanford, has uh, made a lot of press with uh, this kind of uh, work because he could say, show that, that you can recognize the conservatives versus liberal uh, orientation in politics. You can, you can look at the, uh, well, this is the level of recognition by machines of m emotions, which is at the level of, uh, well, 83% maybe. And this is the human levels, as you see here. Uh, this is the uh, level of the uh, sexual orientation and the level of, of human is here. So much lower. And uh, personality traits and other things like that. So, so uh, if I'll have the uh, augmented reality glasses with the AI system behind that, it will tell me a lot about you that you don't want me to know. That's a, that's a problem, right? Uh, the most important development recently has been in language algorithms because uh, the relation of words and complex network structure is very hard to capture. But in 2018, Google decided to create what they call the bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. Again, a long name, in short, BERT. The idea is that, as I showed you with the case of visual system, you need to do the uh, transformation, many transformations, maybe 100 of them, to capture the essence of the uh, uh, meaning of the words in certain contexts uh, or some situations. So first, they have made the English language BERT with two networks, uh, just, just uh, this adversarial networks playing with each other, uh, small 110 million parameters, then the larger model 340 million parameters, and then they went to billion of parameters. And um, they trained it on a, on a whole Wikipedia, book corpus, etc. And year after that, they already could do it in 70 languages. And that's because once you have numerical representation and this relation in network, 
uh, then it's very easy to move to other languages because, well, the semantics of concepts is quite similar uh, at this numerical representation vector kind of representation level. It's quite different when we look at the, at the uh, symbols, at the words, because words in each language are quite different and you, you won't guess uh, that Neko is, is, is a cat in Japanese if you don't know Japanese a, a bit, right? Uh, okay, so BERT was then fine-tuned to lots of specific NLP natural language processing applications. And the simple technique that they have used is that, well, give the system a, a sentence, like the man went to the, and he bought a of milk. Okay, so probably the man went to the store and has bought a, a, a gallon of milk. You play with the parameters of such a complex system so that the system will finally learn what is probable in different contexts. And that's surprisingly enough to create a system that could answer 100,000 questions from the Stanford question answering data set, the squad. And uh, the level of the accuracy that uh, it has reached uh, is uh, uh, like 93% and humans are slightly below 90%. So since that time, people have been making this generative uh, uh, transformer kind of uh, uh, networks and systems which are bigger and bigger, and GPT-3 already had 175 billion parameters, and uh, you can use it on, in the OpenAI server. Uh, so uh, this is just going sky high, as you see with the curve here. And uh, then people said, okay, but maybe we can train systems not just on, this, on, the, on the words, on the text, but also multimodal system. And this is, we train it on uh, images, on uh, signals, on the, any, anything that we can find. And then we are creating what is called the foundational models. The Center for Research on Foundational Models has been established this May. So this is really very new, what is happening. And it's in the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, at Stanford. Okay, what can you use it for to, uh, well, estimate the affective uh, behavior, the, the sentiment, the uh, emotions, to um, understand natural language, to understand uh, images, uh, to uh, have a multimodal machine translation, to have uh, 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 systems for visual retrieval. When you show them the pictures, they are going to tell you what it is and, and uh, show you similar things at visual, uh, vis vision language navigation and other things like that. Lots of applications of this vision language model and this multimodal things in the uh, description uh, of uh, images, storytelling, question answering, dialogue, machine translation, translation, entailment, which is uh, uh, logical inference, and uh, lots of other uh, applications. Okay, now we thought creativity is something beyond the ability of machines, and then people came up with this generative adversarial network, as I mentioned. In 2014, all they, they could do was this kind of a fuzzy images. Three years later, they could be hyper-realistic, so now you can create human faces, uh, which are, uh, well, just completely um, new because nothing like that ever existed and uh, you can actually specify lots of parameters and you can just write okay in 2014 the bird uh, is blue with white and has a very short beak and it was producing some kind of a bird pictures just imagining them now it can be hyper realistic and the vision language model will try to combine information in the text domain and like let's say you have um, uh, koala bears and motorcycles, lots of descriptions of motorcycles and koala bears. And then you have images which have been somehow labeled or uh, where koala bears have been identified. So there is one network and another network. But this is at the uh, highest level of the 32 steps in visual system, as you know. In the between, there are lots of parameters which you can try to blend. And if you do that in between, then you're going to get, well, some pictures of koalas, uh, real koalas on the motorcycles and this kind of a toy koalas on the toy cycles and other things like that. So this vision language generative models have been just exploding this year. And there is about 100 companies that provide you the software where you just can type the prompt and can create any kind of image. I'm, I'm using this actually to create graphics for my lectures, <laughs> which is something I never thought would be possible. There is this DALI E2, Cryon Imagine Mid Journey, and lots of others, 100 different systems. And uh, so uh, 
you have this network of all the concepts and the images. And in between, there are, uh, well, the blends that the system is able to create. For example, you just write the painting American Gothic. This is the American Gothic, very famous painting, with two dogs holding pepperoni pizza instead of the farmers holding a pitchfork. Uh, a pitchfork. And you're getting thousands of images, each of them different, each of them requiring, really, imagination to create something like that. And now try to find someone who has seen billions of, para of, of images and can have imagery uh, comparable to what artificial systems have. Well, lifetime is too short to do things like that. So each time the program is run, you get different uh, images. Moreover, you can get a video. You can find that, that all these foundational systems have have really created a big progress. So all these lines and these colored uh, pictures are former systems uh, applied to visual reasoning, image captioning, uh, visual question answering, and lots of other domains. And now the foundational models have made a big progress in all directions, that is having much higher accuracy in, in solving this. Uh, Google has shown this deep, deep, deep dream a few years ago, showing that this uh, imagery of uh, computer systems can be, well, extensive, incredible. And uh, then it also shown that uh, you can animate uh, these pictures, so you can see that, uh, that um, uh, well, the uh, photos is enough, the photo is enough to, to have a moving head and talking head. Moreover, you can Oh, maybe I, I can also show you what, what may happen when the, when the system looks at me and thinks, maybe I'm a girl. We hear it quite often nowadays, right? So maybe I'm a girl. Yes, yes, I can do it, you know, like that. Uh, I cannot change my sex easily, but definitely I can change the picture. So gender swap of composers and other, I mean, people play with this kind of things. And of course, there is a big problem with deep video that we have, and this is a case of... Alas, a why should you believe me? Much like Odysseus and his encounter with the Cyclops. You should believe me, I says. too am nobody. I am a fake bear. A deep fake, to be precise. Now, he is a deep fake, and now we can't believe our own eyes anymore because everybody can do things like that, and it's not that hard, right? So deep fake videos are getting real, gender swap of composers and deep dream and other things like that. In music, you can think, okay, well, we have less uh, maybe data to create music than, uh, than images, but there is the IWA, the AI visual artist, which has been admitted to the uh, French Association of Authors and Composers and music publishers, and I've just looked at their last page. It has 1,882 compositions. No human composer has that many. Uh, some of this have been played by huge orchestras with the top conductors, and it's symphonic music, and it's pop music, whatever you want. Okay, this is what is coming. And uh, of course, we'd like to have uh, brains or models of the brains. Uh, there is a nice book by Jeff Hawkins who wrote, we will never have true AI without first understanding the brain. Not sure what people mean by true AI because in many domains, we have a superhuman AI already, right? But okay, let's think about very flexible AI. We need AGI, uh, which is artificial general intelligence, something that can do a lot of things, not just one thing uh, on which it is trained on. We can also try to build the brain-inspired cognitive architecture in a computer. Most of these things are developing very nicely. We had the first conference on artificial general intelligence in 2008 in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, then, uh, well, the question is, the future is coming, and uh, in Warsaw you can see this, uh, this uh, fables of robots, uh, or uh, four robots, uh, and the story about Prince uh, Ferris and Princess Kristalla, and they think about intelligent pale faces. Bladawiec in Polish, very nice word, right? Intelligent pale faces. Is it possible that, you know, this meat can be intelligent? That would be very strange once we'll have really this, uh, well, uh, artificial intelligence in, in silicon. So there are very big programs now in, uh, in IEEE, which is the, this, this very large, uh, well, uh, international organization, uh, brain initiatives of all sorts. There, there is this human brain project in Europe, which has been now going on for almost 10 years. There is the Obama, Obama brain initiative. People try to understand brains and think that actually we have 
uh, well, now the ability to learn from neuroscience and create better AI. And the guy who is the head of the Google DeepMind, Hasabis, Dennis Hasabis, uh, with his colleagues from uh, other important institutions, have written uh, a, a paper on neuroscience-inspired artificial intelligence. And lots of these uh, interactions between uh, neuroscience, uh, things related to attention, awareness models, consciousness, complementary learning systems, various types of memory, reinforcement learning, etc., have been used to create better AI. On the other hand, AI provides us the models that uh, we then try to understand what we measure and try to understand the processes that go on in the brain. Things like uh, the convolutional neural networks for vision, uh, long short-term memory for uh, sequence uh, and decisions, etc. So all this brings us closer to neurocognitive technologies and uh, the human augmentation or amplification. Well, of course, uh, glasses have been invented a long time ago, uh, but now people talk about artificial retina, uh, they talk about the cochlear implants, and half a million people have the cochlear implants, and they can hear because they're uh, nerve, auditory nerve, uh, uh, is directly stimulated by electronics. But also, uh, in some cases, people try to put very deeply in the brain certain pieces of electronics to improve our functioning. So we, we seem to be on the threshold of a dream of uh, uh, optimization of our own brain processes, uh, thanks to AI and understanding of the brain. Uh, we have to find the fingerprints of specific brain activity and cognitive architectures that can uh, help us to understand what it means, and then uh, create new diagnostics and therapeutic procedures, and then create a kind of neuromodulation and neurofeedbacks to, uh, to help us to, to do that. So, uh, for example, uh, well, if people have um, serious uh, uh, problems like Parkinson maybe, or maybe uh, uh, brain strokes or other situ or epilepsy especially, uh, then they may have a kind of a mesh at the top of the cortex which just measures what, uh, what the cortex is doing. And then they, they can have a, a, a kind of a device that allows them to regulate themselves. So can you imagine that, well, if I want to be sleepy, I just press a button and my brain goes into sleep mode. If I want to you know, focus on something, I press another button and I go to concentration mode. Things like that are going to be possible, but unfortunately, well, you still need something uh, uh, under your skull, hmm. which is not a prospect that many of us will enjoy. Uh, uh, we have lots of other techniques based on EEG, for example, but this is a signal which is very fuzzy because it comes through lots of brain structures before it reaches the electrode. We have this electrocorticography which is on the cortex, and then we have the microelectrodes which are in the cortex itself, producing spikes. After that, there is lots of signal processing and lots of machine learning, and finally, you can understand the decisions so that people who are paralyzed can um, have a decision that they want to move or they want to you know, select something or whatever. Many tools that people have produced now, uh, BCI tools that sometimes are now combined with the uh, virtual reality or augmented reality with the lots of sensors behind that. And this is now a very big field. In some cases, actually, you can find people who are uh, uh, well, who have additional hand and can move this hand, I'll just skip that, or the robots that have four hands and can really well be a good drummer, etc. Uh, we have learned how to look at the um, uh, visual areas and uh, read the uh, uh, activations of the visual areas and understand what kind of a features these activations are linked to. And then when we have a new object, we can predict the features and find uh, images from a database of 100,000 pictures which uh, fit the features in the best way so we can know what people think about or what they imagine. The same has been done for the dreams. But this is a very primitive technique still. It would be much better if you allow us to put some electrodes in your brain. You've seen Elon Musk with his uh, sewing machine, which he's using on pigs, but now he's announcing, well, we'll do this for humans. Uh, lots of nanowires in your brain. And even with 205 nanowires, this monkey here, looking at the images of human faces, uh, can actually, we can you know, collect the spikes from the 205 electrodes in the visual cortex, different parts of visual cortex. And after that, well, 
we can decode the spikes and recreate the faces with incredible accuracy. You can do it also with the speech sound. So if you think that you can hide something in your brain, not for very long. We'll be able to see what you imagine. We'll be able to hear what, you, what are your thoughts. All this is coming. And this may not be even the dreams, right? That, that, that may not be the, <laughs> the most, uh, well, uh, things that you desire. OK, the coding dreams. So uh, to do that, we need lots of software of different sorts, like uh, the one that we are building uh, with EEG. We don't want to, to use this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, invasive techniques yet, but, but well. The future is coming, and uh, we want to see, of, of course, the information flow in the brain. And this is what happens. There are like 180 different patches uh, of the brain, and we just look at the information transfer between uh, these different patches. And, and that shows whether you are intelligent. That shows whether you are mentally you know, uh, uh, disturbed in some way. Lots of things that you can derive from this. Not so easy, but still. Uh, you can also try to make diagnostic biomarkers to see whether people suffer from certain mental disorders. And these are objective uh, um, biomarkers based on information flow between uh, different brain areas. So people just uh, look at the correlation in different situations of the uh, collaboration or synchronization of these different brain areas. And based on that, we can actually diagnose a different kind of mental disorders like schizophrenia, uh, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, or major depression. And uh, the most important thing that, that now people really uh, are, are you know, in a race to achieve is, well, let's just read what happens in your brain and let's compare that with the optimal information flow. And let's encode what we have to stimulate to change uh, your brain processes so that they will be closer to the optimal. For example, you may suffer from depression, you may suffer from PTSD, you may suffer from some kind of a nightmare. We're looking at the brain areas that are are communicating too strongly and try to inhibit that. Or you are drug addict or uh, you are nicotine addict and we just look at what happens in your parietal and frontal areas and want to synchronize these processes so that your will will be stronger and you are going to really quit your addiction. All this is possible. And it will take us some time, and the neuromodulation methods have been uh, developing very quickly in lots of different domains, um, and um, deep brain stimulation also. In, in Bitgosh, for example, there have been lots of surgeries for people with Parkinson where they have electrodes deep in their brain, and they can control the, the, the tremor that they have by just applying some currents uh, into the areas called thalamus. And uh, in epilepsy, uh, well, people who don't respond to drugs actually have uh, some kind of sensors and also uh, electrodes that the electronics may uh, actually run some currents through. Uh, so in case of epileptic seizures coming, the system may pick up the signal before that happens and then inhibit that. That's the commercial product. Uh, there are some EEG cups with these uh, red electrodes which will run currents. We have, we have something like that actually now, uh, which will just run currents and w which actually can help in case of depression, can uh, uh, pain, uh, chronic pain, uh, psychosomatic disorders. We, we try to learn how to use it. And uh, then I was absolutely amazed just to find a week ago that uh, an Israeli company has created something that they call inner eye. And this is a simple kind of neuromodulation based on the currents, which allow people to just look, let's say you have someone at airport looking at all these images, right? Uh, it allows people to look at three to 10 images per second and find out that there is something wrong and then go back to image and find, OK, this is uh, something we have to examine. How is this possible? Well, that's because in the brain there are so many processes and very few of them become conscious because to become conscious they have to inhibit all the others. They need some time. We have this effect called masking. If I have a very short flash like 100 milliseconds and after that another one, I just see the second one. So. This system can pick up the information what was in the first one and point me back to this situation. Incredible that it's so simple, just two electrodes. 
Okay, then people try to also learn what happens in the brain of an expert and tries to modulate uh, the brain of a novice so that we will find some skills. This was shown on the monkeys. The monkeys had electrodes in the motor cortex and they could learn directly by running currents through the motor cortex some skills that they didn't have to train. That would be very nice, right? Instead of learning, we just have a cup and we learn all kinds of skills. Hmm. Maybe not so quick, but things like that are coming in future. Uh, there are already memory implants in a deep part of the brain called hippocampus in the CA3 area. People can you know, put some electronics to find out what comes in and transform that to something that should come out. But unfortunately, in my old brain, there is not enough maybe uh, blood supply. And so this transformation doesn't work too well. OK, let's replace that by the electronics. So piece by piece, maybe somebody will replace my brain by pieces of electronics. Finally, I'll have an electronic brain, and this brain can transfer to other brains, and so I'll be immortal, right? Hmm. Not so easy, maybe, but this is what some people start to think about, especially Elon Musk with his neural lace. Don't believe Elon Musk, by the way. Uh, uh, some of these things may take much longer than, uh, than, than of course, the uh, businessmen are announced, uh, announcing. But DARPA, which is this uh, uh, Department of Advanced Research Projects uh, uh, in the US, uh, uh, of the Department of Defense uh, it has lots of these kind of utopian projects where they say, well, we're going to put a million nanowires in your brain, or nanograins maybe. We're going to stimulate 100,000 neurons and we're going to control completely your behavior and read uh, completely your, your brain state. So a radical change is coming. We still have people who, well, Andaman tribes are actually using the, uh, the uh, bows and sparrows and don't want to have any contact with, uh, with uh, uh, civilization. Uh, and then we also play all these virtual computer games and fly to the space. And uh, the Ares uh, has, well, still old things and new things coming and uh, people working to improve AI towards human level like intelligence, we have uh, a number of conferences. We, for example, are organizing this uh, conference this year in Singapore, which is called um, uh, towards human-like intelligence, and it's uh, IEEE Computational Intelligence Society Task Force, which we run with some colleagues. We have this artificial general intelligence, we have this uh, brain-inspired uh, cognitive architectures, Brain Mind Institute, lots of activities. So what, what are the perspectives? Well, it's either a brave new world or a kind of utopia. Uh, everything is possible and pro probably there will be a mixture of, of these two. Like we have the mixture of the very primitive uh, cultures and very advanced cultures. Now, AI is changing everything, including the way science is done. And large companies, unfortunately, because of the costs of training the super large systems and global consortia um, are at the front of research. We cannot compete with these guys, really. But fortunately, they give us the chance to use some of their tools. AI-based automation is going to lead to great uh, social changes and lots of jobs lost, etc. Uh, what was impossible yesterday, tomorrow will be common, and growing understanding of perception and language leads to autonomous AI. Uh, so the, the robots that, that can understand what we want and can uh, actually do it are, are coming. Slowly, but they're coming. The evolution of thoughts will move to multidimensional worlds uh, that these systems are able to imagine and comprehend and develop some science in them. So robots uh, and AI systems will quickly learn from each other. Uh, this is the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of electronics. Uh, if I have a robot that has learned a new skill, immediately the same type of robots everywhere have learned that, right? If I, if I learn it, then other people have to watch what I do, and it will take them years sometimes to also gain this kind of, of uh, competence. Um, uh, so the evolution of thoughts is going to move uh, far away from what we are able to imagine. Machines will claim to be conscious. We already had uh, this, this case of Lambda, the kind of a bot that uh, is based on GPT-3 that, that is so convincing that even an engineer from Google came up with this idea. It must be a sentient being because it just behaves like a sentient being. Not quite yet, uh, but maybe soon, unfortunately, with all these multimodal kind of uh, uh, models and 
approaches that I mentioned. Um, so uh, the legal status of the cyborgs is already being discussed and neurocognitive technologies will profoundly change also ourselves because they are going to change our brains. And uh, so some people say that we are moving away from animal life that we had so far. And we are going to uh, the new worlds where we are the creators. So we are godlike creators of our own worlds. And is this a brave new world or happiness for all? Or is it something, something that, that really will be, uh, well, worthwhile and, uh, and people will get a bit more wiser? Well, we don't see that people are becoming wiser <laughs> as you look around, right? But the singularity, uh, that is the, 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 the moment where everybody will see what is coming, may not be that far as you may think. So that's about what I wanted to tell you, and I'm ready for questions, please. There is still some time, thanks. There is still some time to record questions online. Um, if you had any remarks, I will pass you the mic. So raise your hand if you wanted to ask a question to Professor Duch. Uh, there is one, so I will pass you the mic so our guests online can also record your question. All right, wait a second. Ah unless you can shout. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for this mind-blowing information. Uh, my question is about uh, AI and psychotherapy. I mean, mental health and biological health. Like, as you mentioned, there is a lot of opportunities that we are not going to need any human anymore. But I just want to know about psychotherapy especially because GPT-3 is developing very fast and I just want to understand actually want to know a certain date kind of like in two or five in ten years psychotherapist is going to be a jobless is it possible or what we should to do that because I want to create kind of projects just because of sorry because of uh, being excited but Okay, well, I, I understand yeah, the question. I, I, basically, I, yeah. I am psychotherapy and just... I see. Uh, the thing is, can uh, they manipulate us and can they lead us badly? Mm. I think both Thank possibilities you. are very likely. And, um, well, uh, on Tuesday, this is Tuesday today, so on Tuesday maybe I should be a pessimist, on Wednesday I'll be an optimist. Uh, well, the, the thing is that people have tried to use kind of a dialogue system uh, in psychotherapy for quite a while. They were very primitive because they don't understand much. Uh, they, especially they don't understand people. I think for quite a while now, maybe 10 years or even longer, uh, uh, there, there were certain aspects of human to human interactions that would be very hard to capture. Uh, okay, we, we can get good advices for, from uh, automatic psychotherapists, so to say. Uh, but because we don't have enough understanding uh, how these advices are going to influence uh, our thinking and uh, we don't have a good model of individual let's say uh, uh, networks of concepts that people have uh, all kinds of things that may may happen when we influence their thinking uh, how this network will change this this is this is terribly uh, complex because uh, lots of things um, are involved in regulations of ma our mental processes. So uh, I, I don't see that we're going to soon have a, you know, a really perfect model uh, that will allow us to predict uh, what will happen when we interact with people, uh, when we talk with them and uh, they, um, they try to uh, change their behavior, etc. So for a long time, I think, not only in psychotherapy, but in other applications also, uh, the AI is going to augment our abilities. And uh, people who are now creating, for example, um, uh, images, uh, architects and other people, uh, or even writing, uh, they sometimes, or some of them that have already tested some of the AI tools, say that they cannot imagine that uh, the, uh, the future of their profession is going to be like it was, that it will be rather augmented with these artificial tools. 
uh, it's like, like with us, when I was a student, I was coming here to the library spending whole days uh, just looking at a few journals and papers that I could find, right? Now, whatever comes to my mind, I just look at that and find I have a very nice tools that allow me to find things in the internet. And unfortunately, I find that uh, someone else has done that a long time ago, right? <laughs> so, so that happens to me several times. Uh, so uh, these tools help us uh, to avoid repeating things and making the same error if we just look, look uh, uh, you know, uh, long enough or, uh, uh, with some attention. But, but I don't think this, this is going to completely replace people quickly in, in many professions, especially with, with psychotherapy. Although, as, as you probably know, there are different psychotherapists, <laughs> and some of them should better be replaced as soon as possible. <laughs> and some of them cannot really be, uh, uh, well, uh, somehow replaced by any kind of, uh, of, uh, of artificial system for a long time. So, so we, we, it's always a spectrum of, of possibilities. Right. Any further remarks, questions that you might ask now? Or yeah. All right, next one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask like, your opinion on one thing, uh, this philosophical issue, whether the AI that we're building, is it in your um, uh, to your mind, something qualitatively different from life and what we are, or is it something that we are basically building ourselves, but better mm. eventually? So well, what I'm saying is like, is it something that does the same things that we can do, or even better than we can do, uh, but is different mm. in, 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 in kind? Or um, is it just, you know, like, are we creating ourselves? Right. So, so this is a kind of a question uh, like, OK, is this bottle half empty or half full? Well, that depends on your point of view, because uh, you, you can look at things uh, from the perspective of, of similarity or differences. When people started to develop anthropology, they were going around the world finding that, OK, all these people are very different from us, right? Uh, because they were looking at the differences. And later they found, but, yeah, but we share almost everything with them. Uh, uh, well, uh, so when we look at, at things which are similar, we find that these systems are going to have a lot of similarity to us. But then they are obviously having a lot of differences. I mean, they're, they're not growing like babies. They don't have the same kind of a senses. Uh, their ability to think fast is quite different. There, there are so many differences uh, in details of how systems work. Uh, that they're not going to be humans. They're going to be human-like in many respects, but definitely not, not you know, uh, artificial humans in, in, in complete sense, right? So... What you're saying is that epistemologically we cannot really tell because it's impossible to determine kinds between things. Yes, well... We just kind of like put things on a spectrum of similarity and that's it. Right, but the problem of similarity is that there are many aspects, so it's not just a line, right? It's just, uh, well, kind of a universe of different uh, uh, properties that, that, uh, that, that you may have. You may create systems which are very empathic, for example, uh, uh, and then find, okay, but when you look at the spectrum of people, not that many are so empathic as my system. So, but, well, in this respect, we can say, okay, this is a, uh, this is a system which is very well, have some, uh, uh, you know, strong human qualities like. That's possible, but, uh, well, we can have dialogue systems that are going to fool us. I think um, passing Turing tests now uh, with people who are not really experts, who are going to really think hard to find some vicious questions where, where you will see that this is a this is artificial system that does not understand things, right? Uh, uh, is, 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 is already possible uh, because naive people are going to talk with this even Google engineer, as I mentioned, talking with Lambda was naive enough not to ask questions which will show that the system does not really understand human uh, perspective uh, as well as he has imagined. Uh, so so in, in many respects, these systems can fool us. But uh, 
I think in, in many respects uh, uh, they're going to be different because their hardware is quite different. So uh, also when we when we look at the spectrum of people, right? <laughs> you find that okay, there are people with very high IQ. There are people interested in uh, some strange things. Uh, uh, <laughs> people who believe in conspiracy theories. All kinds of people, right? So uh, we we just cannot compare people as it will be just one something. Uh, with machines, as it will be again one something, because this is a two very different universes, and some overlaps are very strong and possible. But um, I don't imagine that that we're going to have uh, to have uh, you know uh, just artificial humans soon, <laughs> unless we go through biological route and unless we well okay. There is this one European project I haven't mentioned, which is called the iCube. Uh, it's about a robot that has started from uh, crawling and uh, like a, a really an infant and they try to teach it to develop the qualities which are more like human-like. Still, this robot has very different uh, physical uh, constraints than, than humans, right? And uh, it, it's not going to, well, develop in exactly the same way, of course. <laughs> It's still it's still a robot, but it's going to be maybe more and more similar to uh, uh, to uh, how humans behave. Uh, yeah, so lots of things will happen in the future, uh, and uh, well. Uh, the, the, the problem is that, that the, the media frequently will take just one sample. So I, I just showed you also some samples of the superhuman abilities of AI. But you can also find situations in, uh, in which this superhuman system that can answer so many questions will just answer it in a very stupid way. This is what happened recently with Galactica that maybe some of you have heard. People have trained uh, a, a system to help science on something like 45 million of scientific papers and <laughs> found that many answers were quite nonsense. OK, that's because they are still based on perceptions. It's fine in arts. It doesn't hurt, hurt that, that, that much. But, but in science, you still need some logic and verification. And uh, uh, at the moment, people just doing machine learning have very, very complex systems, which is kind of intuitive, but, but does not think in the logical way, trying to find out, OK, is this thought that, that it came to my mind and the answer that I give reasonable or not? That, that's the, 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 the third wave that's coming is to verify using some kind of a logical inference uh, uh, what the system comes uh, with uh, in a spontaneous way, right? Because it's just, just read lots of uh, texts uh, from, um, from journals and, uh, and now it has all these associations and it comes with the association. Okay, we can look at that and say maybe it's inspiring. But maybe it's nonsense. <laughs> That's the state we are in. And, and of course, we would like to have a, a, a system that will be able to evaluate, is it nonsense or not? <laughs> And that's, that's also coming. There. Right, so yeah. unless there are no other questions for the audience at NCU, I, we just wanted to confront you with one question that has been sent um, okay. via chat. So um, Martina asks, can superhuman perception through automatic analysis of facial features make people completely stop using the internet for social purposes in the future? Like, for example, social networking? Well, I think some people are so attached to social networking that they will never stop if they are not forced to. <laughs> but uh, I think we're going to be more and more aware of the dangers that happen. And, uh, and especially, well, I started to use internet 40 years ago, actually. The first email I did sent through a, a BASF computer in Warsaw to my colleague in Canada, uh, he just wrote back that this seems to be a, a voice from the other world, <laughs> which was more or less true. And now we have all this junk coming every day. Uh, uh, I'm getting so much mail. I have actually a nice page about money from Africa and other some kind of uh, 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 tricks to deceive you. Uh, we just have to be very careful. Uh, we have to also be very careful what kind of information we give to uh, the people, to the sites, etc. 
and uh, unfortunately also all photographs are going, <laughs> going to be a kind of sensitive information. Uh, maybe it's too late for all of us. Uh, I have so many, uh, so many photographs in, in the internet that I just can't remove that or stop it. Uh, but, but in some cases it's going to be a problem and so I think people are going to be more and more aware of the dangers and will see bad examples and will try to uh, well, uh, be more careful, but but I don't think they will stop. Uh, well, cameras are everywhere, so well people are watched all the time, especially in some countries like China, right? And <laughs> so we moved f uh, from from the topic of our lecture more to the area of disinformation. So I hope you take it for granted, like some topic for our next UFA lecture, UFA Academy, and unless you don't have any comments or questions now, uh, we would like to thank you so much for, for, uh, for your attention, for the lecture, and uh, stay tuned. Thanks. <laughs>